Hello and welcome back. And thank you to all those new subscribers that have signed up in the last month or so. It really makes a difference to the channel and gives me an incentive to keep making these videos. Now in a previous video we took a look at some of the AI tools in Photoshop and some of the other plugins we use quite often. And in this video we're going to take a further look at some of the other AI tools in Photoshop and see whether they work or whether they're a waste of time or not. And a spoiler alert, some are good, some are not so good, and some are just plain awful. So let's dive in, take a look at them, and then we'll discuss how they work. Now the first tool we're going to take a look at is a new tool that's been added to Photoshop for 2024, and that's the Remove tool. And it nestles here on the toolbar uh, on the left-hand side, and if you click on it, it tells you that it easily removes things from Im images imperfections etc. Now it's meant to be either a replacement or an adjunct to either the spot removal tool or the content aware fill but how does it work in comparison to those other tools? Well let's just take this example here of this image and let's say for instance I want to get rid of this little tree here. Uh, now the conventional way to do it would be to say well let's use content aware fill let's draw a little lasso around the features I want to get rid of and see how that works. Uh, let's just go straight into Edit, Content Aware Fill, and we can see that um, if we look at the left hand side, it seems to want to pick up all sorts of bits of the image that I don't want to use as part of the fill. I don't want to use any of that other tree. I'm happy to use the sky and the sand and everything else. Uh, and so generally we can choose the areas that are used to create the new filled in area. And so let's click on OK and you'll see here if I zoom in we've still got the lasso around the area to highlight it. And generally it's not done too bad a job but when you look a bit more closely you see that there's a bit of a disruption here between the lines in the water and the sand. A little bit of a bump here and the horizon's got a very strange hump in the middle so although it's generally matched the content there are a few detail issues there that don't quite work so let's um, let's deselect that and I've previously used that and the next option we can use is to use this new remove tool and let's see how that works and with the remove tool all you need to do is grab the tool make it a large enough brush using the square brackets key and we just draw around the area we want to get rid of and see how that works and I think that pretty much covers what we want release the mouse key the mouse button and it's mm, done a pretty similar job to the content aware fill we've missed out on some of the, let's just get the pointer, we've missed out on some of the junctions here and the ocean's got a funny kink in it as well. So, yeah, not quite as great a, an idea as we might have expected. So let's just go and undo that. And let's try another option and that would be to use the generative fill and see if that works any better. So far, it's okay, but it's not perfect. So I've gone back to the original image. Let's just uh, see if we can reselect that area. Yep. And then we can just go to our generative fill toolbar. Now, if you're like me, you find that, that having the toolbar floating down the bottom of the screen is a real pain. I've just docked it up here on this top right hand side of the menu panel uh, because there's really nothing much happening there. And I've just kept it there permanently. So all I need to do now is just hit generative fill. I'm not going to change the content, I just want it to generate a new uh, fill-in area for this and let's see if that works any better. But so far, none of the tools are perfect for this type of area and uh, we'll see whether Generative Fill does a better job or not. Well, here we go. We've got a new Generative Fill layer and yes, I'd have to say that, well, it's picked up the right line of the horizon for a start and we don't seem to have any disruptions in the lines here between the water and the sand. So I would generally say, if I turn that new layer back off, even the very first iteration of that, and as you would probably know by now, if you've used this before, you get three alternate versions of this 
when you use the generative fill and I think the first one works better and if you want to keep what this has generated what you need to do is then is get rid of and by deleting hitting the little rubbish bin on these two keep the one you want and then because this is an active layer or a smart layer you need to right mouse click on it and rasterize that layer to lock it in and then I would merge that down eventually but certainly in this case the new remove tool doesn't work so well on a larger area but the generative fill works really well so let's have a look at another option so we'll look at another example uh, using the same techniques. Now I won't go through all the steps on each one because otherwise you're just sitting watching me doing the same things but firstly I wanted to get rid of this area. Well I didn't really but this is the example and the first example I used was to use generative fill. I highlighted the area around it uh, and if I um, turn those layers off you'll see that I selected an area and then used the generative fill and in fact the generative fill did a really good job here of matching up all of these textures and the colors and that worked pretty well but the next option I used was to use the content aware fill and you'll see if I can turn this off and on you'll see that there's a little bit of a disruption here and it's not quite as good it's not too bad and if you wanted to just clone a few areas in to patch it up it would be okay but there's a little bit of a funny line there um, where it's not quite blended together as well whereas the generative fill has, has done a little bit of a better job um, and let's have a look then finally at the remove tool we'll just go back to um, a layer that I, I used and use the remove tool to paint that area in and you'll see here that the remove tools made a bit of a hash of it so as far as removing larger elements of an image, the remove tool, while it's nice and easy, you just paint it on, you don't have any control about where it's sampling the details from, and um, it, it does a reasonable job, but it's not anywhere near as good as the new generative fill option. So in that case, I would really be sticking with the generative fill for this type of thing, where I had a larger area to fill in, and, um, and those other tools, while they might be a little bit more convenient to use, they're not brilliant but I think the remove tool is great for things like removing dust spots very minor defects and things in areas where you're not going to really notice a slight difference in texture so it's a little bit of a hit and a little bit of a miss for that tool but again I think it's more of an adjunct to the other existing tools that you might want to use so let's now move on to look at some of the other tools in Photoshop that are so-called AI integrated and uh, let's see if any of those work any better than this one. Now for our next bunch of uh, filters that we're going to take a look at we're going to move into the Photoshop neural filters and to work with that we need a portrait and this is one of the ones I generated using the generative uh, uh, tools in Photoshop so this is a portrait that doesn't exist anywhere in the world other than on my computer but to access these let's go up to the filters menu we come down to neural filters and there are a number of different filters and the reason we're starting with a portrait is that the, we have a number that are designed to work with portraits uh, and if you are new to using this a number of these will need to be downloaded as plugins into Photoshop um, for you to use and um, they take a little bit of time to download because some of them are quite large but we've got a couple of options here we've got a skin smoothing option let's just turn that on and we've got a couple of sliders here that will give us an idea of how it's going to look and you can see here there's a little blue box drawn around here because the software's worked out that there's a face there and it's applied some blurring and some smoothness to the skin now if we come down to this little box here we can just click on that takes us back to the original you'll see that this particular generated image had a whole lot of weird uh, blemishes on the skin um, and a little bit of texture here and there and what's happened with the skin smoothing it smoothed all that out um, and depending on what sort of options you choose here you can you can really crank it up and make it really really fake looking um, 
and you can blur it even more and obviously you can reduce it so I think used used in extremis it's um it's too plasticky you can see there that that's really gone over the top and it needs to regenerate each time I change anything here let's cancel out of that because I created a version earlier using the neural skin smoothing which I saved as a new layer and that's how it will work when it is applied to your image and you can see that with reasonable settings it's not too bad but of course being a separate layer you can always reduce the opacity and it works generally not too badly and if you really wanted to you could mask out um, so that it doesn't apply to some of the areas you don't want it to um, it does tend to soften a little bit around some of the edges but again you could deal with that quite simply with a little bit of masking so the skin smoothing option is not too bad so let's just go back now into those neural filters and have a look at the next one and I'm going to move through these relatively quickly because there are a number of them and some of them you'll find are just quite bizarre but um, the, the other one that we could look at is the so-called smart portrait now this I think falls into the category of bizarre and crazy um, and you can change the features of your model here by saying well I want them to look a bunch happier and so if I move that slider all the way up to the right maximum happiness level it'll come in here and it's processing in the cloud for this because it requires a fair bit of processing power and it'll end up with something quite bizarre now I'm just going to cancel out of that because it takes a little while to do but I made two a little bit earlier now the first one was a a happy aged version so an older version of this lady and she's happy now to me that's just ridiculous um, I think that's pretty awful um, what about if we wanted to make us sad and we've got a sad uh, a younger a younger sad one and that's really I think pretty useless to be entirely honest now I did I did push those sliders a little bit towards the extreme ends but just to give you an idea I think quite honestly if you wanted to just make them look a little bit happier you could just um, uh, use a very small amount but I think it's almost something that has very limited use now the next filter we're going to have a look at is a, it's still in the uh, um, portrait area back into the neural filters and the next one is going to be called the makeup transfer now this um, allegedly will allow you to take the makeup and the colouring from one portrait and apply them to another now uh, there may be some uses for this but I think it again falls into the category of a bit bizarre and rather strange so what you need is you need two portraits one that you're going to copy from and the other that you're going to uh, move it to now I've got this image I'm going to copy them the makeup from and I have uh, another number of other images open and they need to be preferably open uh, within Photoshop um, I don't think it will work applying it to the um, the landscape images so I've got another image here that I've previously worked on and uh, will go okay and we'll see what happens when we transfer the makeup now this time I've transferred the makeup from um, the previous one to this one so that her eyes have changed um, let's just uh, deselect that and yes you can see what happens is it's taken this eye makeup maybe changed the lipstick color a little bit hmm yeah doubtful but if I go back to the other image and I do the reverse thing where I copy the makeup from that image to this one it gets even more bizarre it um, it does this weird lipstick thing and looks like she's got black eyes um, and it's quite patchy so again I would put the makeup transfer in the category of um, gimmicky and of very limited use uh, for most practical purposes so let's move on now to look at some of the other filters that uh, might have a little bit more of a wider application now to look at some of these further neural filters let's move over to looking at a landscape so we'll just get rid of these images now we don't want those anymore thank you very much and 
let's have a look at this image and I'm going to try some of the neural filters here. This is an image from Iceland from a few years ago. Uh, so firstly let's go up into the neural filters again and this time we're going to be looking at the landscape or creative ones. The landscape mixer, again you if you haven't already downloaded these you'll need to download these to be able to use them. Now you've got a couple of options here you could use their, their presets which again in my mind is using someone else's image in your image so I wouldn't use that um, but if we go across to custom you get the opportunity then to select an image now it seems to take a while to find out that I've got images already open in Photoshop and it has to think about it for a while before it finds them so we have to try this a couple of times before we find one that we want to use and um, you can see that it's a little bit slow and we'll try it again in a second. Okay so in this case I'm going to try mixing it with an image from the Tasmanian rainforest and let's see how this works. So it takes a little while to think about loading the image up and again it's decided yes here's the image that I want to um, um, to use. I'm not going to crop the image in any other way. I'm just going to apply it. I'm going to apply it at 100% strength. I'm not going to change any of these settings. We'll use that for another example and it will process it and come up with something. Now here we go. Here's the image that's allegedly combining those two together. Now if I click on this layer again to go back to the original um, it's applied all of this sort of texture from the Tasmanian image but somewhere bizarrely it's added in a waterfall and other features that just don't exist in either image so I'm not quite sure where that came from. This image is a landscape with mountains and sky the Tasmanian image is just in the rainforest so I'm not entirely sure where the um, waterfall came from it's just dreamt that up so let's cancel out of that now because I've already done that previously and it does take a little while to process these images so here's here's my Tasmanian one combined let's just fit that back to the screen uh, yes you can see that it's quite odd in in what it's done um, so I would say mm, limited value and um, I think you'd have to be very sparing in the way that you applied it because it's just created something that's really quite strange um, and then we can um, try another alternative and that's using this this particular image to combine with the other one which is from Torres del Paine in um, in southern Chile and uh, it's an again another landscape image let's try combining it with this one and I won't go through the process again because it takes a little bit of time but here's the result of that hmm well it didn't really do an awful lot um, it's um, it's really quite a little bit odd in the way it's done things and here in this little part of the image here you can see that it's not particularly high res there was a rock in the original image and in both versions it's made like a little donut shape there so I'm not quite sure what's going on there um, that wasn't particularly effective but let's go hmm let's go a little bit crazy and try uh, another setting so let's just go back into um, the filters I won't go through the time because these ones do take a little bit of time to process um, we can use the other uh, whoops not skin smoothing we want the landscape mixer again and again don't use their presets use your own images and this time I'm going to try changing the seasons. You'll see here I've got winter, autumn, summer, spring and you've got a strength slider and you can also do day, night or sunset. I won't actually do that because it takes a little bit of time to process but here's the result. I've got a winter 50% strength and combining it with that image from the Torres del Paine area. So something really strange has happened in the sky. I think this might be the mountains in the background and it's given a coating of snow and turned all the grass from green to burnt orange uh, and again I think you'll find that that's pretty bizarre and even if I drop the uh, opacity of that back a bit uh, you might get away with something like that 
But again, the sky, you'd have to be fairly selective about what you do. Hmm, not so great. So, so far, most of these, and you'll see if you look at some of the um, Photoshop fanboys videos on online, they'll tell you how great all of these filters are, but entirely, uh, I think, they're a little bit of a gimmick and not a lot of use in the real world. Um, so let's have a look at another option there, and that is the style transfer. Um, again, I've combined two images together. I've taken the Torres del Paine image and combined it with this image from Iceland. Let's have a look at how that looks, and we'll go in and have a look at how that filter works. So filter, whoops, I've got to be working on a, a layer that's visible, obviously, to make it work. And what it's doing is this this next option is the style transfer where it takes the style of one image and applies it to another now again i won't use any of their presets because they're not my photographs again you select an image and you will have options to choose uh, various settings now again it takes a little while to process let's just have a look at the result and that was the taking the Torres del Paine image, which was this one, and transferring it onto this one. And this is what we got. Uh, again, <clears throat> not only has it sort of made this sort of weird effect on it, but it seems to have destroyed the resolution of the image as well. What was originally a nice, sharp, clear photograph has now become all mushy and, and quite frankly, very gimmicky and very poor all right so we've tried that that was at 50 percent strength and we could go even further and say well let's let's transfer the style at full power and see what it does and it's even worse it's some sort of painterly i suppose you'd call it painterly effect um, and it's just awful so that style transfer total mishmash the blending of two landscapes together, very unlikely to find something that works with that either. So let's now move on and look at a couple of other options. Okay, so we've not had a great deal of success so far with these AI tools. So let's now move on to something that I have used a little bit in the past, and that is in restoring some black and white photographs and using some of those tools. Now here's a photograph that I made again in Iceland and the original was in colour but I liked the the version that I made in monochrome because it actually gave me a lot more atmosphere but let's try using some of these other AI tools now and we're going to skip a couple because some of those we'll come back to for another time but in this instance we're going to come down to the the colour section and I'm going to ignore these two, we'll deal with those at another time, but the colorize option here is quite an interesting one, and that is for taking black and white photographs and then restoring the color. Now, I've done a few of these previously because I've been working on some old photographs for a couple of different projects, and in this case, I've taken the monochrome photograph and added the color back in, and you'll see here that looking at the preview, it's not done, not done too bad a job. It's recognised foreground, it's recognised sky, and it's generally not done a bad job. Now, I'll just quit out of that because I have previously done this. Now, one thing important to remember, if you're working on a monochrome image and you wanted to colourise it, you must first convert it to an RGB image, not a grayscale image. Now, this one started off as a colour image, so it was always... Um, an RGB image but you, you'll see here that it's um, normally if it's a black and white photograph it would be grayscale you need to make sure it's converted to RGB color but here's um, uh, what we did with the neural filter it's not too bad it's generally applied some coloring which you could tweak up there's a little bit of an area here where it's missed out adding the color but you could fill that in and I'll show you how I did that on another example but generally um, there's the monochrome version this is quite a moody photograph it's it's retained the the feeling in the photograph pretty well so that's not a bad uh, feature to have let's let's see how it looks on restoring an original old photograph now this is one that um, I restored previously 
it, the original image was from the uh, internet and it has had quite a lot of work done to remove all the grain and distractions but here we're wanting to try and work on the colorizing filters now again i'm just going to make a, uh, a another copy here that we can work on because i have done this previously but let's go into uh, and again i've made sure that it's a converted it to an rgb image in this instance we go into the filters neural filters and we'll come into the colorize option now it, it's noticed that it's got a face it's quite handily recognized that and so we've got some options here here's the original photograph it does offer some various profiles for various color mixes i've played around with those and i've found that nothing much seems to change with those but uh, you might find something different now i think in this case it certainly colorized a fair bit of the photograph it's um, it's picked up the face it's picked up hair color it hasn't applied the hair color all the way through and we've got a few sort of odd mixes of blotches of color i think you would probably want to reduce that a little bit because it's a little bit too strong now of course we have no way of knowing what this lady's hair color or face color or clothing color were but we're, we're doing a simulation here so Let's just cancel back out of that because I have done this previously. Now, I found, if I just disable that, I found that when I did this originally, it had added a lot of weird colour down the bottom here where it couldn't identify what was going on and the background was a little bit of a mishmash. So what I did was I applied a mask to this, removed the offending colour areas, which was basically along the bottom, around this side uh, around the lips where it had gone a bit crazy and over here so let's just go back um, and if i disable that mask again you'll see that the lip color was i felt a bit too strong so i partially removed that so we're sort of part way there with this restoration but then what i did then was sample some of these colors apply them as a color fill layer and then just paint in the colors where i wanted so for instance i sampled the uh, the blouse color and painted that in as a a solid fill layer blended to color only reduced the opacity and then just painted in where i wanted that to fill in down the bottom and then i went further up and i sampled that hair color and i painted that in up here to sort of fill in the rest of the hair where it had missed it and i left the background pretty much alone so in restoring an old photograph it's done a half reasonable job I think you use it as a good basis and then with a little bit of extra work you could um, you could certainly use this for restoring old photographs and it does quite a reasonable job and I've got one other example of this which is an old photograph and this comes into uh, also looking at the restoration of black and white photographs that is another option here with the neural filters now I've done this restoration myself this was a photograph of my grandmother as a young lady and this was what I did with the restoration. I converted it, got rid of the sepia tone, rectified a lot of the defects in the image, got rid of all these glary spots. This was scanned from a, a really old print and you can see it's not particularly good. And then I colorized it and, and made up the colors. It's not too bad. It's a guess at the dress color, of course, nobody knows. Um, but then looking at the, the way the Photoshop neural filter did the photo restoration, that's what it did over, um, over the original. So if I turn that off and go back to the original, it certainly improved it a bit. hasn't done anything about any of these spots. Um, and if I look at my restoration, you'll see that you can actually do a lot better yourself if you're prepared to invest the time. And that's the question. If you're not wanting to spend the time on some of these valuable old family photographs, then you could use um, the neural filter. But again, it's it's a little bit patchy. And um, we can also then look at what it did with the colorizing. And it's sort of got some of the idea here. And of what I've done is I've used that sort of purpley color on the dress. But then it's added brown here. And then it's gone brown and purple. And then mist bits here and there. And the facial features are not great. Put a bit of hair colour in the hair. So it's not fantastic, 
um, I used that as a basis and then uh, dropped the intensity of the colour back and then just worked it up a little bit better. So uh, the, again, the, the colourise option, it works to a point, but you need to do some extra work to make it work with old photographs. And while we're looking at restoring old photographs, using the neural filter, we'll just take a very quick look at that because uh, you can do a much better job yourself using things like uh, Nick uh, Silver Effects and um, doing a little bit of work cloning and restoring the image because while it does a little bit of work for you uh, on this um, photo restoration setting you can um, you can see here you've got a couple of sliders and you can play around with it um, and you can really see what it'll do but with a lot of these old photographs there's not a lot of tonal range in them and obviously they've faded and so forth and the, the software can't tell where for instance there are defects in the image and blotches and so forth so it has a limited application um, it does something it does build up a lot of contrast and does a bit of work but to be entirely honest you can do a better job yourself um, using things like Nick Silver FX Pro, Denoise and Sharpen and then adding a little bit of cloning to fill in the gaps and if you're prepared to spend the time you can do a much better job so moving on from that let's look at a couple of the other things and one of those is the uh, super resolution and I've um, I've got this photograph here that uh, I took some time ago in southern Argentina and we've got a couple of options here we've got a, a filter called super resolution um, and it's intended to do a similar job to what Gigapixel does um, in doubling the file size. So for low resolution images, it's, in, it, it's intended to give you a larger file size to work with. Now I've done this um, using the Super Zoom. And what I've done is I've scaled the image back down to the same overall size. So we can see that we've doubled the, the file size and this is using the neural filter super zoom. Let's just go back and have a look at how that works. Filter, neural filters. Takes a little while to do. Super zoom. Super zoom. You've got a range of options here. You can use noise reduction. You can apply some sharpening. And then you've got your um, size that you can enhance it to. Uh, I'm not going to do this again because this one also takes quite a lot of time to process but using the super zoom it's enlarged the image twice size so I've scaled this up to fit the, the page but I've also done the same thing using Topaz Gigapixel and comparing the two the neural filter doesn't do a bad job Gigapixel does slightly a slightly better job and retains a little more detail but um, I think yeah, if you really wanted to enhance a, a low resolution image, it would be worthwhile going to Gigapixel. But if not, using the Super Zoom uh, two times is about the minimum um, that you can go, or sorry, the maximum you can go to. Beyond that, it starts to really lose a lot of detail. So I wouldn't be bothered with that too much. But while we're here looking at this, we have another option here, and that is to use the uh, another of their neural filters and that is called the lens blur or depth blur shall I say correctly and here we've got um, an option where we can um, apply a little bit of depth of field effects now you'll see it automatically detects the the subject or the main element of the image and in most cases it does a pretty reasonable job it's detected this as being the important element and it's blurred the background and of course you have a couple of different options you can change the focal distance you can change the focal range um, and you'll see here that the background is rendered quite out of focus um, and that's not a bad option as long as you can see here I've gone back to the original the background was quite sharp if we wanted to then blur that that's quite okay I'll cancel out of that again all of these filters take a little bit of time to process um, but it does a fairly good job you may then have to apply a little bit of masking to the image to make it work now the last 
one we want to look at very quickly uh, is one that we also use in photo restoration and that is the JPEG artifacts removal. Now I've got an, another old photograph here. This one is uh, Solomon August Andre who was the uh, Swedish person that attempted to cross the North Pole in 1897. All of these photographs are taken from the internet. They're of all very low quality and with a lot of JPEG compression. So what we can do is we can use the, the filter here in neural filters to try and remove some of the JPEG artifacts. And if you come down here to JPEG artifacts removal, uh, we have a, a couple of options here. We can have strength, low, medium or high. We, we opted for high and it does some processing and you'll see that it does some work in removing some of the artifacts in the image but it's it's by no means sufficient to really uh, restore a very poor quality image. It might work well on um, some moderately good images but let's have a quick look now at how we could restore this. Uh, that's, that's the artifacts removal. You can see that it's removed some of the graininess but still it's a fairly poor quality image. So let's have a quick look now at how I restored the same image using a couple of other techniques and I've covered these I think in other uh, videos but we'll quickly step through here firstly I use the topaz D noise to remove the noise remo remove severe noise you'll see that it's done a remarkably good job but not perfect it does introduce a few little artifacts and some funny textures but we can fix that um, and then I did some um, sharpening to just try and restore some of that little bit of detail and then I'll use the neural filter here to remove some of those resembling or remaining uh, JPEG artifacts which were still in the background. Um, I then had to do some patching and cloning of, of all of these little defects in the images and you'll see there that there's still some odd bits here that don't quite work so what I did then was made a duplicate duplicate copy of the layer and applied some surface blur which I then painted in uh, onto the image just to remove some of these were bad areas of, of defects that came into it and again we're talking about a very low quality image that we started with and then I used the uh, neural colorized filter and again you can see that it works well in some areas and then seems to drop the ball in others. They've got the background, a blue background um, and a brown suit which it may well have been we don't know but then I had to do some fancy colorizing myself and filling in the background and then finally I did a little bit more of that JPEG artifact removal at the very end uh, and made it into quite a reasonable photograph if we go all the way back to the beginning and see what the difference is that's what we started with that's what we achieved using the JPEG artifacts removal does help somewhat but you do, you do need to do some other work to restore a really poor quality old photograph. Now we've gone through these fairly quickly uh, hopefully this has given you an idea of what works and what doesn't work and quite honestly there are only a few that work well enough to be useful the rest of them really fall into the category of a gimmick and um, you know fun to play with a little bit but you're never going to use them um, for any serious work. So I hope that's all been interesting and look forward to seeing you again soon.